in our previous lecture, we introduced this concept of platonic universe, which is this abstract space which is full of mathematical objects, pure idealized objects. Today we are going to start a program of having interactions between these objects. We are going to start with numbers, in which case we speak of arithmetics. Arithmetic is the science of manipulating numbers, which means adding them and multiplying them. The main contribution to this respect maybe comes from the Indians, who uh, invented this way to write numbers, that's called the numeral uh, positional system, which means that instead of using something quite simple, like the Romans, so you know the Roman write number, this is one, two, three, uh, the Phoenicians, like the Romans, would use the same principle all the way up to nine, so that would be four, uh, but at some point, of course, it starts to get an effective or boring to write number like this. So we introduced new letters. So the Roman introduced the V like this for five. And uh, four, they would write like this, actually. They would write it as um, five minus one. Then that's six, five plus one, seven, eight. For nine, uh, we do the same with ten. It's ten minus one. So that's the ten Roman numbers. Again, the Phoenician would uh, introduce new numbers, new symbols for the numbers, uh, starting from 10 upwards. And in this way, well, it's not practical, of course, because you can see that uh, you cannot write very large numbers, and uh, Romans, they still conquered most of Europe, um, and uh, large parts of Africa, so they uh, certainly had to deal with big numbers in one way or the other, if only for finances or the number of soldiers. So they had to introduce uh, quantities, over quantities like this, so they didn't stop at 10, then they used uh, L for 50, there is uh, C for 100, D for 500, and M for 1000. And they didn't introduce more numbers because presumably they didn't have to uh, use much num much bigger number than, than this one. There are some rules to write these Roman numbers and they are actually quite complicated or sophisticated. It so happened that the largest number you can write using this rule is this one. You have to use no more than uh, three letters uh, in a row, so that would be of, of the same kind, so that would be 3,000 here, then we've got here um, 1,000 minus 500, minus 100, that makes uh, 9,000, and then we get uh, uh, this combination, which is uh, 90 and 9. So that's the largest number we can write, 4,000 minus 1, they don't write it like this, interestingly, because that violates this rule, it's subtracting 1 to 4,000, that's the largest number that can be written with Roman numerals. Well, they still invented new tricks like bars to multiply by, by 10 or by uh, over powers. Uh, the point is that it's kind of confusing or at least not very effective. What the Indian did is that they use um, symbols. So actually, nowadays we use uh, Arabic numerals, Arabic letters, Arabic numbers that I will write here. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Very familiar for everybody, of course. So this comes from the Arabs, not from the Indians. But the Indians, they had this idea of if we want to add one number there, then we change the position, which means we come back with these two guys, and uh, the fact that this one is on the left of this one, it means that we went to the next so-called order of magnitude. So now we are in the orders of tens, of which we can carry on, 11, 12, till uh, 19, and then we use the same, so next number, same principle, 22 till 29, until 90, 91, 99. And then this positional system from the Indian tells us that we have to use, coming back to our initial two numbers, we have to use the same first number but displacing them this time by ranks of two. So that makes 100 till 999. That's the second order of magnitude, the one that belongs to the 100. And like this we can write basically all the numbers. Uh, it's actually um, something that we still use uh, to this day. We didn't need much more sophisticated way to write numbers, except that maybe we use this so-called scientific notation where we put a power to mean the number of zeros. So this 100 is 10 to the 2, because I've got two zeros in 100. If I want to write 1000, I have three zeros, that's 10,000, 100,000, and 1 million, which is 1 with 6 zeros, 1 million. So this we call the scientific notation. Also because we can go the other way around, so to uh, look at numbers that are smaller than 1. So that's 0.1, which we would write 10, minus 1. We put a minus to say that we are going uh, below the decimal point, below the comma. So 10 minus 2 is 2, 0. 
is 2 0, I've got 1 0 here, 10 minus 3 it's 3 0, so on and so forth. And like this, we can write all the numbers. So if I want to write uh, 3.72 times 10 to the 5 or uh, 4.17. 10 minus 7. You yeah, have got a large number and a small number, and they are very different in magnitude, but they are equally uh, easy to write. They have the same level of complexity. So this is very nice because we've got precisely this important concept for us in physics, as I said before, this order of magnitude that tells us to which class of bigness some quantity belongs. Okay, so here I've got with 10 and 1, which is 10 to the 0, that's 1. I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 orders of magnitude. If we look at the orders of magnitude that we have in the um, physical universe, this is finite, as far as we know. Namely, the largest, uh, if we speak of land, for instance, of distance, it's always nice to take distance to imagine uh, quantities, physical quantities. So the largest distance is 10 to the 27 meters, because we are speaking of distance, and that's basically the size of the observable or visible universe. We don't know if the uh, actual universe is larger than that. Interestingly, it could even be smaller, but uh, we, the, that's how far, how much we can see. That's the biggest number. The smallest one is a so-called Planck constant, and this is uh, much smaller in terms of orders of magnitude, of zero we can put uh, to describe this. That's 10 minus 35 meters, that's the so-called Planck slant. After that, we don't know something which is smaller than that. We uh, we don't know how to describe it. We don't even know if it exists. So how many orders of magnitude we've got in our physical universe? How many zeros from one side or the other of the comma? Well, this is uh, 27 minus minus 35 plus 1 because I have to include the 10 to the power of 0. 1, 1 is an order of magnitude. And that's make, so uh, that's a plus here, 27 plus 36, 35 plus 1, 6 plus 7 is 13, I carry on 1, 6, that's 63. So we've got 63 orders of magnitude in the physical universe. There is a very nice book by Keith Buck, uh, old book of the mid-60s, I believe, where he uh, described what happened in each of these orders of magnitude. So in his time it was not 63, it was only 40 of their magnitude, and he's starting with a girl who is sitting with a cat um, on her lap, and he's looking at uh, the next order of magnitude, so 10 meters around this girl, and 100 meters, 1,000 meters, kilometer, and all the way up to the largest structure known in the galaxy. And then he goes in the other direction, so below the comma, for the zero that go uh, after the comma, and he looks at uh, 10 uh, centimeter, the centimeter, the millimeter, and uh, so on and so forth until he gets as as uh, as small as was done in his time. It is a really nice idea that has been uh, taken over in more sophisticated form, which means uh, making movies out of it. There is one very famous nine uh, 1977 movie by this uh, this couple of architects. Uh, I think they're called the Hims Hims couple. And uh, you have certainly have heard about this movie, if not, I invite you to look at it, it's really nice, and there's been a lot of remakes that are uh, more sophisticated, better done than, uh, than this time, 77, it's a long time ago. And um, as well, allowing to look into larger, uh, larger number of magnitude, because as science progresses, we uh, can go farther and we can uh, deep, um, deeper, we can dive deeper into the infinitely small. So, a uh, nice things to look at. This scientific um, notation, it also allows us, like this 3999 uh, of the romance, it allows us to see how big are the objects that we need to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, so a, a number as large as 10 to the 10, which is a 10 with um, 1 with 10 zero behind itself, it might look very big, but actually it's not that big. There is this nice quote of Feynman that um, we used to speak of very large numbers uh, to say that they are astronomical numbers, like they are uh, 10 to the 11 stars in our galaxy. And to say that something is really big, we say that it's an astronomical number. But if you look at the deficit of the United States, for instance, the national debt, which is shown here on this side, well, if you count the number of zeros, so you've got 3, 6, 9, 12, 27, so that's 27, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 12 is a trillion. So it's uh, an order of magnitude larger than the number of stars. 
So Feynman was joking that we shouldn't speak of astronomical number anymore, we should speak of economical number. But it's not only economy, actually, it might surprise you, but um, it's been estimated that the number of trees on the planet is also of the order of the trillion. So it means there are more trees on Earth than there are stars in our galaxies. And um, these scientific notations allows us to get an idea, or an estimate of how various things uh, are big or not. For instance, how many atoms do you think there are? Remember, 10 to the 11 stars, 10 to the 12 trees on Earth, how many atoms would we imagine there? It's not such a big number, actually. Um, it's estimated as 10 to the power of 80. I believe that um, Plato himself, when he was estimating this, he was estimating it in this way, uh, how many uh, grains of, of sand, how many pecks of sand we would need to fill up the universe, as defined in his, uh, in his own way, in his own time. And uh, he, he estimated this as something around 10 to the 60 or 63, so not, not such a big number. It was big for the Greeks, of course. Um, how many, let, let's look at other possible big things. How many g game of chase there are? This is surprisingly much bigger than uh, than everything we've seen so far. It's estimated that there are 10 to the 120 games of chess. That gives an idea of the complexity of the game. Much smaller uh, number of possible chess positions there, 10 to the 50 or 10 to the 53, something like this. So it shows that only the order in which you can play the move is what matters. So um, depending on how you ask the questions or what quantity you look at precisely, the uh, result can be quite different. There is a nice number that you need to know about to describe this big thing that has been introduced by uh, mathematicians, uh, actually by the nephew of this mathematician, which is 10 to the 100. So 1 with a 100 zero after it. This is called the Google. Google. And you might uh, know a variation of this name, which is Google. Uh, that uh, are initially the founders of the, of the famous uh, internet company, wanted to name their startup after, but there was a, a, a typo, a mistake, and then it became known as Google. And if you take 10 to the power of a Google, Google, that's called the Google Plex, and that's this type of big number. Okay. Um, as well, I wanted, speaking of Google, I wanted to tell you that recently someone at Google computed the uh, number of decimal of pi, they computed uh, in the trillion as well. I think it's 31 trillion number of decimal after the comma. So you see, it's not the case that we can find very easily, concretely, uh, something that is much, much bigger than the trillion. Whenever it's much bigger than this, like this or this, these are abstract concepts that we can imagine. We, we know that they are in the platonic universe, but we can't really put our hands on it and uh, actually um, make it explicit, um, realize it in the, uh, in, the, in the physical universe. For instance, these uh, this decimals of pi, these 31 trillion digits, they exist, but to actually get access to them, I believe you need several hard drives or things like this. It's a, it's a large quantity of information. Okay, so to carry on uh, discussing about arithmetics, instead of looking at the very basic uh, addition and multiplication, which again are so simple, so familiar, that they might actually confuse you into thinking we are doing things that are too easy and not worth discussing, let's look at these uh, ideas of playing with numbers, but in a way that is probably not so familiar to you, is when you change the basis. So you are using the basis 10 of the, of the 10 numbers, we've got 10 numbers, and that's definitely why we are stopping uh, at 9, and then we use this Indian mm, positional system to carry on. Some people use the basis 20, actually. That's interesting, because it seems to imply that they also use the feet to count. But we could use any other basis. Yeah? Actually, we do use other basis. If you look at the time on the clock, we like to use numerals, Roman numerals for that. 1, 2, 3, up to 12. Um, this is the basis 12, or to count time. Yeah? We count time in the basis uh, 60. So let's look at the basis 12, for instance. We call this basis duodecimal, which means that we still got the uh, 10 number of the uh, Arabs, brought to us by the Muslim scholars in the 14th century, I believe. But now, instead of using the trick of going to the next order and using two numbers of our basis of numbers to go to the next order, we add, actually, the number 10. We give it its own letter will be the letter A, for instance, so I have to invite something. So some people, they like to use this kind of thing, though, inverted 2, inverted 3, but it might even be more confusing. So what is really popular is to use letters. So now we've got our 12 symbols. 1, 2, 8, 
nine, sorry, let me put uh, something so that you can count with me. That's one, two, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. We've got these ten, twelve numbers. Okay? And now, how do we represent quantities in this basis? So let's take, for instance, the quantity 1, 2, 3. That's the number 123 in a decimal. So to make clear that it's not in decimal, we like to put parentheses like this in the subscript. It means in basis 12. So to remember, we are using the duodecimal system. So this one is the uh, third position, which means that it comes with the um, power 2 of the basis, which is not 10. As I said, you see, I'm really used to the basis 10, like everybody else, huh? but it's the basis 12. Then we've got 2, which is the power 1, because that's this position here. And then we've got 3, which is uh, at the position uh, 0, because that's the first number. So that's this number in basis uh, 10. You can count what this is. 12 squared is 144, plus 24, plus 3. That makes uh, 148 and 3, that's 11. I carry, well, I carry uh, 1. That makes 3 and 4, 7, 171. That should be what is 1 to 3 to the power of 12. Unless I make a mistake, please check. Okay? Like this, it's easy to convert. If you want to go the other way around, so let's take this number for instance. A, B, I don't know, A, B, 2. Now it's clear that it's um, a duodecimal notation because I've got these letters A and B. If I tell you that 1, 2, 3, uh, 12, you might not see that this is a decimal, uh, a duodecimal number because it could be also a decimal number. But these things is definitely not decimal because in the decimal system we don't have A and B. So in case it was not clear, I will use colors this time. I will use various colors. So I will use the one which is here in red, then this one in pink, and then this one in this weird violet. Okay, in basis 12. So we said that A is which number? A is the one which is after 9. So this is 10. We make this calculation in the basis 10, of course. Then 12 to the uh, power of 2, because that's 0, 1, 2. Then we've got plus B. What is B? B is the one that comes after 10, that's 11 times 12 to the power of 1, plus 2, what is 2? Two? 2 is 12 to the power of 0. So that's the same 2 in the duodecimal and in the decimal, of course, because it's below the order of magnitude of both bases. So we count again, that's 144 uh, multiplied by 10, plus 11 times 12, that's 11 squared plus... Uh, 11, so that's 121 plus 11, that's 132, 132 plus 2, so that should give us again 4741, 1400 and 1500, sorry, 1700, 1574. Well, check again, we are never uh, sure not to make a mistake when we do arithmetic, but if you do it twice and find the same result, you are fairly convinced that you have the accurate result. Okay, so that's uh, simple enough to change basis. Now let's look at the other way around. If you want to go from a number which is in the, um, in the decimal basis, so let's take the year, for instance, of, of of now, 2020, in the basis 10, how much is this in the basis 12? So to do this, we need to look at the concept of Euclidean division, because we need to know um, how many times this number fits in the various orders of the basis 12. So let's compute this various order of the basis 12. We've got 12 to the 0 is 1, 12 to the 1 is 1, 12 to the square is uh, 144, 12 to the cube so that's 12 to the square uh, multiplied by 12. So that's 144 multiplied by 12. That's this plus twice 144, which is this. So that should be 1,600. There's the 8 here. I've got uh, 12 and I carry on the 1. So that's a 7 there. I think this is correct. 12 to the cube. Now, to know 
in the duodecimal basis, how many quantities I've got here at the order 2, so that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. So um, in all likeliness, I will get I will get uh, a digit in my duodecimal basis for uh, this quantity here. How many times? So it will be less than two because uh, two times one thousand seven hundred twenty-eight is larger than twenty twenty. Clearly, yeah. Clearly. Um, so I will get one. So I want to know twenty twenty how many times. That's one. It appears in 107, 1,728. Plus, so what is the reminder here? What do I need to put so that um, this equality is correct? So I need to subtract. So we need to do this. 8 to go to 10, I need 2. Then 3 to go to 12, I need... Uh, um, 12 minus 3 is 9. So then I've got, um, I carried on the one, let's do it slowly, 8 to 10 that's 2, 3 to 12 that's 9, 8 to 10 that's 2, and 0, so it's 2, 9, 2. Okay, so this is an Euclidean division, when I've got a number A, is n times b plus the reminder. Yeah. A is how many times I got this one, and I need to bring the the fact that it doesn't fit exactly. I need to bring the reminder. Okay, so coming back to here, my uh, leading order in the third order of magnitude in the basis of ten will be one, and then I'm left with two hundred and ninety-two. Now two hundred and ninety-two, we are in the second order. In how many times I can fit one hundred and forty-four? in 292. Well, it's at least 2, not 3, because 3 will be friendly than something else, but it's at least 2, because 2 times 144 is 288. And what is the reminder? The reminder is, so let's write Euclidean division, sorry, it's at 144, which is 288. How much is 292 minus 288? It's 4, isn't it? So we've got 4. Now we can put this 2 there. So how many times... Um, this is 12 here. In how many times... Uh, I've got 12 in 4. Well, 0, because 12 is larger than 4. So this is 0. And how many times I've got 1 in 4? Four? 4 times. Okay? So if we did it correctly, 2020, 2020, the current year, in the, du in the decimal system, it's equal to 1204 in the duodecimal system. I let you play with uh, over translation one way or the other. It's a good way to do some arithmetics in a way which is slightly different than what you are used to. Yeah, so it's a nice occasion to play with addition and multiplication of numbers to change basis. One nice feature as well is that you get uh, to play with letters, which you don't usually do with decimal system. Let's look at the division. Now. So one half, one half in the duodecimal basis. How much it is? So this is the number which I need to multiply this time to 12 minus 1, to the power of minus 1. Yeah? Because remember, just like we were going by the comma by 0, 1, 0 0.001, 0 0.0001, 3, 0, so it's 10 minus n, here it will be 12 minus 1. So how many times I need to do this? Actually, it's an entire number because you know that 12 divided by 2 is 6. So here I've got 6, which means because this is minus 1, I have to go one number minus after the comma and I put six. So that's our result. I can remove the intermediate step. One half in basis twelve is 0 0.6. Let's look at one third. One third you know that in the decimal system it has the never ending repetition. Yeah 0 0.3333. 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. Interestingly because 12 divided by 3 is 4 this is uh, this shows that one third in the duodecimal system. This is twelve divided by three is four. Is uh, is four times twelve minus one, correct? Which means that this is zero point four in the duodecimal system. So this is really nice because if we compare it 
we find that one third duodecimal is 0 0.4 which was it's actually simpler than uh, the decimal system some people will tell you that because there are more ways to divide 12 with prime numbers than we can divide 10 because there is 2, 3, 4, 6 we cannot divide 10 by all these numbers we can only divide 10 by 25 uh, the duodecimal basis is actually more convenient but, uh, of course, it would be uh, very difficult to break this force of habit because we are so used, everybody, uh, to use the, the ten uh, fingers, the decimal system, to count. And, of course, not all fractions are equally simple. Let's look at the case, for instance, of um, of 1-5. Because 1-4, one if I let you check, is also a simple thing. This is 0 0.3. But let's look at 1-5. 1 5 is simple in the decimal system, 1 fifth, 1 divided by 5. Then this is 0 0.2. In the duodecimal system, so what do we need to uh, do? We multiply this by 5. So how much is there? We can use the computer maybe. We lose the computer. So I will start like this. We will uh, divide. 12 by 5, this is 2.4, which means that 1 5 in the duodecimal system, so let's assume we are working in the duodecimal system, I will not put the 12 all the time, this is 2 times 12 minus 1 plus 0 0.4 times 12 minus 1. So this 0 0.4 times 12 minus 1, if I want to carry out the extension, I can write it as, yeah, I carry on the same as above. I can write it as 0 0.4 times 12 times 12 minus 2. This is equal to 12 minus 1. Okay? So let's ask our computer how much is 0 0.4 times 12. This is 4.8. So this is 4 times 12 minus 2 plus 0 0.8 times 12 minus 2. Which I will write this 12 minus 2 as 12 minus 3. I will write it better in order times 12 times 12 minus 3. This is 12 minus 2. Okay? And then we carry on like this because this is 0 0.8 times 8. 0 0.8 times 12, sorry, is 9.6. So that's 9 plus 10 minus 3 plus uh, 0.6 times, so we multiply by 12 and um, and lower the order, so get the next digit in the decimal expansion. Because indeed, what we get is that 1.5 is, let's do, that's 0 0.2, 0 0.2. Why could you use the same color, maybe? Then we've got, um, this was 4 at 10 minus 2, so that makes 4. Then it was 9 at 10 minus 3. So at the third order in this duodecimal basis, I've got three. And we carry on like this. So if we wanted to make the computer iterate this, what we have to do is to remove the part which is entire, so that's the floor, and this is the answer, the previous answer, and we multiply by 10. Yeah, if we do this, then we've got 7.2, so my next, my next uh, decimal is 7 and the 0 0.2 I have to carry on. I have to remove the entire part and multiply by 12. That gives me 2. And if we carry on this, you see that I get the various decimals. Okay? So it's an ever ending one, but you will ultimately repeat. 7, 2, 4, 9, 7. I guess it will be a 2 next. And then I guess it will be a 4 and that repeats forever. The same like uh, we get in the decimal system. If we look at 1 divided by 7, this repeats. It has an uh, infinitely repeating sequence. With the computer, if we uh, keep doing this, there is an interesting phenomena that doesn't concern us for now, but that will at some point, is that you see that, you see that these numbers that are rounding errors, they propagate upward until the point where they will start to uh, um, make our calculation invalid. If I repeat this, quickly enough, you see that I get numbers that eventually become zero. So it doesn't mean that the, the procedure actually stops, because it's never ending. It means that we cannot trust the computer past a given number of steps. But this is for uh, next semester when we look at 
uh, mathematics with a computer. Right now we are using mathematics in the platonic universe where it's exact, so we don't make any mistake at no stage, and then we've got this uh, procedure. I want to show you another fractions which um, has uh, an interesting feature. This is one seventh. So we'll do the same. We'll take one divided by seven and apply a little algorithm that gives us 0.1 8, 6, ah, and that's what I wanted to show. And now we've got 10, so we've got something which is, what do I put here? 10. Well, actually, I'm putting 10, but for 10, remember, in the duodecimal system, what is special symbol? A. And then we carry on. 3. That's what I wanted to show you, that we should not keep or lose track from the fact that we are using that's our 10 again, maybe it's coming here, 10. Okay. And then we will get this same principle that there is the um, rounding error that will make the procedure faulty. So if we look, um, we've got the repeating pattern. Yeah, 5, this pattern will repeat 5. So that's the change of basis in the duodecimal system which is uh, quite interesting and something that uh, I invite you to play with like have exercise because that's a nice uh, variation on very familiar arithmetic to change basis not all basis are equally useful some of them are really useful there are two that we uh, tend to use a lot even as physicists because uh, our colleagues from the computer science department use them considerably is the basis 2 binary uh, basis 0 and 1 and the basis 16, the hexadecimal basis. Computers uh, use this a lot, and sometimes we have to play with this. Or so instead of having only A and B, we have to add all up to F, five letters, to have 16 in total. Don't forget to have the zero. A, B, C, D, E, F. But now I want to stop with arithmetic and look at the same manipulation of numbers, addition and multiplication, but not with number per se, with letter, which is like abstracting away the number. This is something that has been realized by the Arabs, they didn't only bring us the number, they also brought us the realization that we could look at properties like uh, this nice equality, which is that the square of 3 plus the square of 4 is equal to the square of 5. That shows that if you take a right angle triangle with size 3, 4, then the hypotenuse is equal to 5. Um, we can write this sort of uh, equalities not only with numbers but with letters. So we would write it as a square plus b square equals c square, which states the more interesting statement that in general, if you've got a right angle triangle with side a and b, then the hypotenuse has the size squi, and this is uh, related through this so called Pythagoras formula. Here we still have some bit of arithmetic involved. I mean, we always use numbers, so to speak, because you see we've got the number 2. We could actually even, in fact, abstract everything and use this in terms of only letters. And this is uh, another interesting equality, which is known as the uh, Fermat theorem, that states that uh, we cannot find any n that satisfies this equality, except uh, when n is equal to 2. We can't find a uh, solution, we can't find ABC that satisfies this when n is equal to 2, otherwise it's not possible. It is a very famous problem because in his own copy of a book which was called Arithmetica, Fermat wrote in the margin that uh, he knew how to prove that, he had the proof for this statement, but the proof was too long so that he could write it in the margin. And indeed the proof seemed to be very long because people after Fermat tried to demonstrate it and nobody, despite their best effort, was able to demonstrate it until quite recently, 1995, where Andrew Wiles uh, finally managed to demonstrate the Fermat theorem but it took him considerably much more effort and time than um, one could fit in the margin of Fermat, indeed. So uh, we believe that Fermat was mistaken and uh, he didn't actually find the proof of this, even though I was correct, uh, he, he made a mistake of reasoning and uh, it was much more difficult to demonstrate than Fermat could have ever imagined. So algebra is really nice because when we've got these things we can make general statements, we don't have to look only at a particular case, for instance, from uh, Pythagoras theorem, we can ask this question. If I've got a triangle which has the hypotenuse C and the side uh, A, what is the uh, length of this uh, triangle? 
if this is a right angle triangle. How do we find this? So we will take this quantity and we will do what one uh, very important uh, Muslim scholar was called Akwarijmi, this person here, um, invented or, or brought or formalized to systemize is the so called balancing of the equation. So uh, he invented for that, uh, we proposed for that the denomination of algebra, algebra, which means in Arabic, if there's someone who speaks Arabic, please confirm, it means the a reunion of the broken part or the meetings of the broken part. So it consists in, in balancing the equation by putting the things from one side or the other to have the quantity that we are interested in. So we are interested here in having B, so we would put B on one side alone by transferring this guy on the other side by adding on both sides uh, minus A square, so the A square cancel on this side and the appear with the minus sign on the other side. And then we can take the square root of both sides, and we have an answer to our question. The length of this uh, side is found in this way. So that's the algebra or balancing the broken parts of uh, alcoholism. And with that, then we can do arithmetics of letters, and that brings us to algebra. So for instance, if we look at um, this product, a n times a m. Remember that a n we said last time by definition is this quantity that you obtain by multiplying a with itself n times. So now we multiply this a n by a m, which again, by the same definition, is multiplying a with itself m times. So what is the result? Well, this is a product here, the same product that we've got everywhere. So if we count how many times we got, we've got n plus m. So by definition, a multiplied by itself n plus m times, this is the power a n plus m. So now we demonstrated this, and we can demonstrate in this way a lot of other things, like this. What is the nth power or a n? So this is a multiplied by itself n times, and this quantity becomes multiplied by itself m times, by the definition of the exponent. So how many times we have a multiplied by itself? Well, n times times m times, that makes n m. So we've got a n m is equal to a n m or a m n because multiplication is commutative, of course. So very nice uh, properties of algebra that we can um, we can demonstrate in this way. Let's look at the way that um, addition and multiplication work together. That's an important relationship. We've got this one: a b a plus b multiplied by c. How do we calculate this? So remember the definition we had. A plus B, so we've got A objects, and to which we add B objects. So B times. A times plus B times. That's A plus B, yeah, by definition. Multiplied by C, it means that we are going to reiterate this C times. So this one quantity. We copy it, I can even do it like this, we do it C times, okay? But quite clearly, we can group it in this way. That's the sum of these two groups. And what is this group? It's the A object multiplied C times, so that's AC by definition, and this group is the B object multiplied C times, so that's BC by definition. So now we've just demonstrated that this is AC plus BC. That's the so-called distributivity of the multiplication over the addition. So it's an important property of algebra that we need to know and apply well. In particular, uh, pay attention that the parentheses are important. A plus BC is, of course, very different from A plus BC because the multiplication takes precedence. Whenever there is a multiplication, we apply this first, and then we do the addition. So be careful where the parentheses are. With this, then, we can look at an uh, important uh, algebraic expression, like this, the square. What is the square of A plus B? By definition, this is A plus B multiplied by itself. Now we apply this uh, rule, so let's consider that this is an object. This object, I have to distribute it over the addition, so that's A, A plus B, plus B, A plus B. I've just used the property uh, we have introduced before. And now we introduce it again, but this time this becomes the object that we uh, distribute over the addition. So that's 
a square plus a b and we do the same with this one that's b a plus b square b times b we've got commutativity of the multiplication so a b and b a are the same thing so that's 2 a b i've got two of them and that's our final result that you need to know from a scratch yeah by heart you don't need to you don't have to compute this all the time because you are going to use it constantly but anytime you doubt, you can derive it again by going through this procedure. And when you'll be tired of deriving it, you'll find that it's easier to actually know it cold. So I will read it again. A plus B square is A square plus 2AB plus B square. Now let's go to the next case, next stage, which is A plus B cube. So by definition, A plus B, A plus B, A plus B. So there are various ways to compute this. We can apply the rules, iterate the rules we have just introduced on this quantity. Or we can recognize here a plus b squared multiplied by a plus b. This a plus b squared, we know now that it's a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, to which we multiply a plus b. And now we can use the distributivity of this over this. So we've got the product here and we've got the sum. So uh, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to use a that I distribute on everybody first. So that a cube plus 2a squared b plus b square a we'll use the commutativity later and then i'm going to use i'm going to use the distributivity of this component and that makes plus a square b plus 2 a b square plus b cube okay and now with the same color because i'm going to bring them i count how many uh, things i've got here it's a cube i said cube but i wrote square so we've got We've got a cube, that's this quantity. We've got a square b. A square b, I've got it there, that's 2. I also get it there, that's 3. Yeah, 2 plus 1, 3. Then we've got a b square. I've got it there, that's 2. And here as well, because remember that the multiplication is commutative. So b square a is the same as a b square. Therefore, we also have 3. And we are left with what? We removed everybody except this last guy, that's b cube. So that's our final result a plus b cube is equal to a cube plus 3 a square b plus 3 a b square plus b cube also something that you need to know called now we could go for a plus b4 a plus b5 a plus b6 you are invited encouraged to do it as exercise but actually we we'll do something which is really algebraic in nature in character is to look directly the same we did with Pythagoras theorem going into Fermat's theorem we are going to abstract everything and replace the, um, the 2 or the 3, the number here, by a letter. We are going to compute a plus b n. And it's kind of beautiful and impressive that we are able to compute something where there are no numbers at all involved. There are only letters there. So n, we are considering that this is an integer. So by definition, this is a plus b multiplied by itself n times. Yeah, remember, that's the definition we introduced in our first lectures regarding the power of any expression. A plus B in this case. So now let's think about what's going to happen. We have to go, if you look at the way we did the calculation before, and we could have done it there, we have to uh, take one term from each parenthesis. So we have to take one of the two here. It could be A or B. So let's say that we'll take A. We have to multiply by one of the two there. So that could be A again. And then the next parenthesis, I could take B maybe. Till the last parenthesis, the nth parenthesis, where I will take, I don't know. I will finish with a B. So each product will consist, will consist of n terms, of course. And then I have to add all the other combinations. Yeah? If we look at this particular case, I will have to choose one letter and multiply to this one and this one. That's one possible case. That's a cube. And then I have to take this, this, and this one. So that's a square b. And then I did all the possible cases with this one. So I have to take the next letter. It will be b a a, b a square, b b a. B, A, B. Like this, I have to exhaust, go in a systematic way for all the possible, all the possible um, combinations. And because of the commutativity of the product, of the multiplications, a lot of these terms are the same. You agree that A, 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 B, A is the same as the combination that will be A, B, A, A, A. Here I decided to take B on the second term. Here I took B on the last two second terms. But they are all equal to the same quantity, which happens to be a fourth b.
here I took the case where n was equal to 5 because I've got 5 terms which means I had 5 parentheses to pick them from so the question then becomes uh, what are all the possible combinations that appear and how many uh, ways they appear how many times these various combinations appear so clearly uh, I can take any number of a, k where k is either 0 which means that I only systematically took B of all the parentheses, or up to N, which means I only systematically got, took A from all the parentheses. But it could be any number in between. Number in between is because I took B, and the number of ways I didn't take B, is an, or I didn't take uh, A, is the number of ways I took B. Therefore, if I took KA, I took n minus k b because I've got k plus n minus k which is equal to n parentheses to take from. Yeah? So from the n parentheses, if I take k a, then I have to complete with the b's which is are left in the quantity n minus k. So that's the possible ways. Yeah? Where again k is between 0 and n. Taking, that's why I put the equal here, taking possibly the values 0 and n themselves. Now in how many ways can this happen? So this is a question in combinatorics, in how many ways I can choose k characters or k uh, symbols out of n. We will not derive it right now because we have another lecture that will come on combinatorics, but it's not difficult to work it out, you can do it as an exercise. I will just introduce the notation. We use this notation which is called the binomial coefficient, and because of this we call this the binomial formula. We write kn in this parentheses and we read this as k choose n or k choose in n. This is the number of ways if I've got n objects, remove this, if I've got n objects, in how many ways I can take k of them. If I've got three people, in how many ways I can form uh, pairs or couples is two choose three. And then you can compute what this is, it happens to be six. So that gives us the uh, result. We've got a plus b n is a n, and in how many ways I can choose um, all n into n. I've got n parentheses, and in this n parentheses, I will take n times the number a. Then the next choice is that I will take all a except one, where in one parentheses I will take b. And in how many ways I can take one b out of n parentheses by notation, by convention, by definition, this is this one choose n. Then the next term is a n minus two, and I took two b. In how many ways I can took 2b out of n parentheses, this is this quantity. So I have to write all the things here, yeah, 3n, and it starts to be a bit, again, painful or tedious to write all this. So I will use this and go till the end. So the last one is, I took only b's, and in how many ways I can take no a out of n parentheses. Yeah, I only took b's. The one before, I'm sure you can agree with me, it will be bn minus 1, 1a, one and in how many ways I can take n minus 1 out of it. Again, there is a formula that gives you this. I let you check what it is in the uh, exercise, or I let you look at it as a personal problem. I can give you, if you are interested, the formula, but don't assume that it comes out of the blue. There is a reason why it's like this. It's n factorial, k factorial, n minus k factorial. I don't comment it more because I will need to introduce this concept of factorials and all these kind of things, which is notation with this exclamation point. This is for coming lecture. Maybe it's in a, the point is that they can be computed. There is a way to compute them. Yeah? So it's not that we are putting some unknown bits in a formula. Everything is well defined. Yeah. Um, you, you can convince yourself that some of these quantities you can compute. Like in how many ways if I got, I've got n objects, in how many ways I can take a, this n objects? Well, there is one way to take all of them. There is one way. So actually n, n, and it's the same with 0, n. In how many ways I can not take any object? Well, only one way, which is not to take any object. So this is equal to 1. So we can simplify this term. In the same way, I believe it's not too difficult to see that in how many ways you can choose one object out of the n. Well, there are n ways, because you can take any one of them. That's n possible ways. And it's also the way you can uh, take all of them except one, which is the same. The question becomes in how many ways I can exclude one object. So n minus 1n is also equal to n. So we can also simplify this term here. So that's n, and that's also n here. I will not, I leave it the end there. We're not going to 
to characterize any further these other things. What I want to show you instead is how to write this very complex uh, expression that involves here some parts we left in the little dots, how we can write it uh, in a single uh, way. Comprehensively, exhaustively, to write everything but in an economic and uh, effective way. We use this so-called sigma notation. The sigma notation is that we need to recognize the pattern and try to encode this pattern in a way that uh, there is a kind of a formula that will uh, produce the result. So the pattern, as we say, is a k b n minus k. Then we've got always n in the numerator. You can check that we've got always n. I removed it there, but it was always n as well, so I can put it back. It was n n and n n here as well. It was n minus 1, so this n comes from before. So here we've got k, right? So this k we call it a dummy index because it doesn't appear explicitly in the result, it appears in the sigma notation that tells you which value you can take. So you can take the value 0 or the value n. So this notation tells you that we can expand this result by substituting the dummy index in red here by the possible value we can take and each uh, particular case is separated by the sign plus. The sigma comes for sum in Greek, sum, that's the Greek S, like the addition, so that uh, makes a product, okay? So we look at the general pattern again, that I will write again here. So that's A, B, that's the general rule, N, N, A, B, actually that's precisely what you are doing, so we'll do it like this, I will copy it. I'm not copying the good thing, let me do it again. So I copy this bit and I copy it there, and I copy it there, and I copy it there. I copied as well other things, but it doesn't matter. Don't pay attention to these things on top. And now we substitute the, the mean index. So we've got k equals 0 here in red. We've got k equal 1, so the k equal, ah, I forgot, I forgot in black, the a n. So we've got n here in black. We've got, what's happening? I change here, okay. That's n, 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 so on and so forth. So now, the part that changed from one turn to the other. So we've got 0, n minus 0 is n. Then we've got 1. That's 1, n minus 1. Then there's 2, 2, n minus 2. 3, 3, n minus 3. And then we substitute. So we can compute. This is equal to, this term is 1. a to 0 is also 1. So I don't write the 1. We are left with bn. Plus 1n is n. a, b, n minus 1. Plus 2n, so we could compute, I will leave it like this. It's a square, b, n minus square. Plus. So like this, you see that we can expand this very um, tidy, concise notation into what would be the uh, actual result, once in expanded. So that's a very nice way to write formulas, the sigma notation. I will write the final result that we are obtaining now. We put it in the red box. a plus b to the power of n. This is called the binomial result expression, the binomial um, theorem, let's call it. The nth power of a plus b is given by the sum of this binomial coefficient a k b n minus k. And we have demonstrated this actually, so you can, you might want to convince yourself that this is indeed correct, but um, that, that's where the formula comes from. And this is also one formula that we are going to use a lot. Now, let's carry on with uh, algebra, algebra of letters. We are looking, uh, we are going to look at uh, operations we can make like um, we define a n and a m, we are going to look at things like a minus n, for instance, or which is the same to say a n, where n belongs to z, rather than belonging to n as before. So in this case, yeah, we can look at this quantity. So what does it mean? We know so far that a n is a times a n times, it's multiplying the quantity by itself, the integer number of times, the one that we put in the power. So what happens if this integer is negative. What does it mean to multiply a, a by itself minus three times, for instance? So here we use one big idea of mathematics, one that is really powerful, is to extend the domain of applications of the formula that we have. 
which means that we are going to use the fact that a n times a m is a n plus m. We are going to assume that this is true not only when n and m are natural positive integer, we are going to say that this remains true where a and n are sine integer. Because like this, we can use this particular case where we've got a n, and for m we take minus n, as a result of which, applying this formula, it's n minus n, which is 0, which is a to the power of 0, which is 1. So, if now we use this alcoholism principle of balancing part, I can bring this on the other side of the equation, this one actually, on the other side of the equation, and that gives us that a minus n is equal to 1 divided by a n. And that's the definition of what it is to multiply a number by itself uh, minus n times. It is to multiply the inverse of the number by n times. Okay? So that's 1 over a n times. So that's the definition of the inverse power. Nice. Let's carry on the idea and let's look at what it is to have um, a p, where p this time belongs to the set of rational, which means that we are only really looking at p q, where, uh, where p and q belongs to the integers, belong to z. Uh, q would be to z star, so q cannot be 0, we cannot divide by 0. So what does it mean to multiply something by itself a rational number of times? Like a, a multiply by itself uh, 1.3 times, what does it mean? So here, um, the problem is, of course, uh, the 1 over q, because we know what it is to have a over p, yes, to multiply a part by p times. So when I know what it is to do a over uh, p, I can use these things of before, using the same idea that we extend the realm of extension of the, of the properties of the relations that we have already introduced. So this time I'm using a n m equal a n m. So if I want to know, if I know what is um, 1 over q, I can say that p over q is to do this 1 over q thing to a p itself. So what we need to figure out is what is the q power of a corresponds to. So here we are going to use again um, the notion that we can use the things we already know and they still work with objects that are beyond the uh, realm for which we have initially introduce them, so remember that uh, I told you that uh, a 1 over q, if we multiply it by itself q times, we will get 1 over q q, that makes a a to the power of 1, which is a. So that's uh, that tells us what is a 1 over q, assuming that this principle of adding to itself q times would work. Um, that's the quantity which multiply. we need to multiply by itself q time to get a. So this we have, uh, which is well defined, right? So this we have a special notation for it. This is the q power of a. So a to the power of pq is nothing else than the q power of a p. And this is well defined in principle. And this also allows us to define the same thing for a r, the r half power, where this time r is a real number. So what does it mean, for instance, to take a 2 to the power of pi? So here we are just going to use the uh, notion that we will introduce again properly later, which is the notion of limit. We are going to say that p in good approximation is 3.14159, and it carries on forever. We need to look at the infinite number of decimals. But we can always look at this as a successive of better and better approximation, where we keep adding decimals. So if we want to look at 2 over p, we can look at what is it to have 114 divided by 100, for instance. That's a good approximation for 2 to the pi. And this we know from the previous case, because now this is rational, that this is the 100th power of 2 to the power of 314. So it's not a really nice or practical way to do it, but at least it uh, tells us how to do it with a computer. This is operation that we can encode in the computer, and we'll get the result. Next, um, in, our, in our program of uh, applying arithmetic concept to letters, or doing algebra, let's look at uh, the, um, the addition of two rationals, the addition of two fractions, or the product of two fractions. Let's start with the product, because it might actually be a bit simpler. So what it is to 
how do we find what is P1 divided by Q1 multiplied by P2 divided by Q2? And you see that now even though I used letters, I uh, put some subscript to these letters. I could have used AB multiplied by CD, but uh, it's better to use P1 and Q1, P2 and Q2, because like this I can see that the PI are the numerators and the QI are the denominators. And I can say that I here belongs to the set 1, 2, and also J. I, uh, I use the same letter for numerator and denominator. So, um, how do we define this quantity? What does it mean to multiply two rationals? So remember that P1 divided by Q1, this we defined in the uh, first lecture of the Platonic Universe, this is the quantity that if I add to itself Q1 times, because remember that P1 and Q1 are integers, they are uh, entire natural numbers. So Q1 is a number of times. So if I add this P1 divided by Q1, this quantity, if I add it to itself Q1 time, I will get P1. That's the definition of this thing. So uh, let's look first at um, at a particular case where Q2 is equal to 1. So I want to know what it is to multiply P1 divided by Q1 by P2. So with this little quantity, like this, I add it to itself Q1 time, and it gives me P1. So this little quantity, I rescale it by P2. We scale it by P2, it means that before it was like this, now it's P2 times this little quantity. So that's P1 divided by Q1, that's P2, P1 divided by Q1. That's this little quantity. This little quantity, if I add it to itself Q1 time, before I add P1, now what would I get? I would get this total, P1 divided by Q1, added to itself Q1 time, that's this total, we scale by P2, but P2 being a linear operation, the total I have rescaled by P2 itself, which means that instead of having P1 as before, this one is P1. Now I get P1 times P2, okay? P1 by P2. So, rescaling the quantity which I need to add to itself, Q1 times to get P1, which is P1 divided by Q2, rescaling this by P2. I obtain the quantity which if I add to itself Q1 time, now I get at the end P1 times P2. Which by definition, what is the quantity which added to itself Q1 times give P1 times P2? By definition, this is P1 times P2 divided by Q1. Okay? So that's the first result we get. That's P1, P2 divided by Q1. So this you know very well that A times B divided by C is AB divided by C. But there is a reason why it's like this, and we can understand it in this way. This is by the definition of what it is a fraction. We need to add it the denominator number of times to get the numerator. We scale by the quantity that we multiply. There is a way to derive, actually, or to understand this quantity. Let's look at the other way around now. P1 divided by Q1 multiplied by 1 over Q2. How do we understand this? So remember, this is the little quantity, P1 divided by, by Q1, which, by definition, if I add it to itself Q1 times, it will give me this quantity, which is P1. Again, that's the definition of this quantity, with P1 and Q1 integers. So now, uh, when I um, look at it in this way, 1 divided by Q2, by definition, is the thing I need to multiply to itself. Sorry, I need to add to itself Q2 times, so that it will give me 1. This quantity I rescale by another quantity, which is this one. Which means that when I add this quantity Q3 times, I will get P1 divided by Q1. So which quantity do I need to add to itself Q1 times so that it gives P1 over Q1? Said otherwise, the quantity that I now need to add to itself Q1 times to give P1, this is, again by definition, P1 divided by Q1, Q2. Q1, Q2 being the number of times I am adding the initial little rescale quantity to get the final result, P1. It might be useful to, uh, to, to look at it geog um, with geometry. Geometrically, I invite you to do it or to do it slowly. But uh, instead of spending more time on this particular case, let's look at one which 
is uh, less intuitive maybe because what we have demonstrated so far is that P1 Q1 times P2 Q2 by now using the uh, property of associativity of the product we have demonstrated that we can merge or bring together the numerator and merge together the denominator which is also something and you know really well let's look at the more interesting case of adding the two fractions because this one has a result which is less intuitive of course so we said we are going to use q for the denominator of course it is not something like this it's not the same that we add the numerator and add the denominators this is sometimes the kind of thing that we find even at uh, the uh, at the foundation year level for instance people can come with these uh, misconceptions of course we need to be um, well beyond that stage but it's interesting it's uh, nice to know where it's coming from so let's look let's look at this construct we have this first quantity p1 over q1 p1 over q1 again by definition i keep repeating the same thing because i'm using the same definition all the time this is this quantity which i need to add to itself q1 times so that the total result gives me p1 and i've got this over quantity p2 over q2 which again same way is the quantity that i need to add to itself q2 times so that it will give me the distance the final results p2 so now if i add these two quantities that i will take different colors for them p2 q2 if i add these two quantities so p2 q2 plus p1 q1 this quantity here in green let us say what quantity is this if i add to itself q1 time i know what will happen with the black part of it it will give me p1 if i add to itself q2 times i know what will happen with the red part of it it will give me p2 but adding it to itself q1 time doesn't tell me what will happen with the red part and adding it to itself q2 times will not tell me what happens with the black part so what do i need to do well, I need to add it to itself the number of times that will make both parts happy, which is Q1, Q2. Because Q1, Q2 is a multiple of Q1, so that satisfies the black part. And it's a multiple of Q2, so it will satisfy the red part. So if I do that, I multiply, or I add to itself the green parts, Q1, Q2 times, what will happen is that the red part will be multiplied by Q2 and Q1. To be added to itself Q2 times, it will provide P2. But it's also added to itself q1 times therefore it will multiply this p2 by q1 so that will give me i will write it there that will give me p2 q1 times okay the p2 comes from p2 over q2 added to itself q2 times but then i also multiply it by q1 because that's what i'm doing for the green part so that's for the red part for the black part got p1 divided by q1 that i multiply uh, by q1 that i add to itself q1 times so by definition of the ratio of the fraction that gives me p1 and similarly this p1 is also added to itself q2 times because both parts red and black are added to themselves q1 q2 times so that gives me p1 q2 okay and this quantity this uh, this uh, green quantity we said is the one that if I add to itself q1 q2 times it will give me the quantity the total quantity which is uh, which is this one so by definition the sum is equal to q1 q2 yeah? if I add this this quantity to itself q1 q2 times it will give me um, it will give me the numerator p2 q1 plus p1 q2 so we've got now the rules for addition of fractions which are right here this is P1Q2 plus P2Q1 divided by the product. So we have to add the cross product of numerator and denominator and we divide by the product of denominator. So it's an important property that uh, you need to also, like the square, like the cube, you need to know it cold. You don't have to think about it, but it's nice to know where it's coming from. Now we'll finish, we'll conclude this lecture by uh, one of the main results of algebra, which is to solve this equation which is called the quadratic equation and there we are using a nice uh, convention which comes from Descartes, French mathematician where you use the uh, beginning of Latin alphabet letters A, B, C for variables that are known in principle so they are not specified but they, their values are still assumed to be known 
because we do algebra we still use letters and then we use and of uh, the alphabet letters x y z for so-called unknown variables quantities which we are looking for so we have a b and c which are specified we want to find x so that this quantity this combination this algebraic combination of a multiplied by the square of x plus b multiplied by x plus c will cancel will be equal to zero so how do we do that we are going to use the property of product which is that when you've got a product let me use different letters so upcase letter this time a times b this product is zero if and only if we've got this equivalence principle we'll come back to that next lecture which means that uh, it goes in this way, the implication and the other way. So it means that uh, A is equal to zero or B is equal to zero. So if this is true, this is true, and vice versa, if this is true, this is true. That's what the if and only if or the equivalent means. So here we are trying to solve something is equal to zero. It would be much nicer if this something we could break it into uh, other terms, because like this we don't know how to solve. But if you've got an equation like uh, ax plus b equals 0, this we know how to solve by the algorithmic technique we bring the b on the other side that's ax equals minus b, we divide by a and then we've got the result doesn't work, so let's do it like this my p over a so the idea is to break our product in this form how do we do this? we are going to use this technique which is called the completion of the square which means that we are going to try to guess Ah, this quantity could arise from a perfect square. Square. So first thing I'm going to do is to divide everybody by a. I divide by a. So I divide here, I divide here, and I divide here. And I can divide 0 by a, of course. That remains 0. To divide by a, I must assume that a is not equal to 0. But if it would be equal to 0, it wouldn't be a quadratic equation. It would be a linear equation, because the square term will not be there. So we can divide by 0. And now I try to guess uh, how this equation here can arise from the square of something. So we know that the square is the square of the first term plus the square of the second term plus the double product. So here it looks like a double product because they've got this that comes from this product and we've got b over, I put 2a because that's a double product. So 2x times b over 2a, the 2 will cancel, that's b over ax. So this comes as the double product. But if I keep expanding this, I indeed have my beginning of the equation, so all these terms so far are well accounted for, but then it starts to become problematic. Uh, my, my program fails when I compute the last term, because that's the square of the last term, which is 4r squared. And this is not equal to c over a. So what can we do? What can we do is um, to add the thing we are missing, so we add it there, and we subtract the thing we have too much, which is this one. So we subtract it there. So we remove this because I'm doing something else, and now I can put the equality here. This is equal to this quantity. That's the completion of the square. Well, if this is equal, indeed, you can check, you can expand this again and find that, uh, check that it gives the left-hand side of the above equation, but it doesn't help us because we've got basically only one x that's the good thing here we have the appearance of our unknown variable twice it was appearing here and it was appearing here again now it appears only once so at least we win something but still we don't know how to solve this equation we don't know but uh, we would if it would be in this type by this property if it would be a b equals zero by this property I said before, that if the product is equal to 0, then each term is equal to 0. So now we should write this as a product. And to write this as a product, there is a nice way to break squares into product, is to use this equality, the difference of the square, a square minus b square, you can check, we are going to check it now. Also something you should know, we can break it in this product, a minus b times a plus b. We make the product of a sum and a difference that gives the difference of the square. Well, let's check that a square plus a b minus a b they cancel minus b square so that works so we could use this we could use this if we had a difference of square we don't have a difference of square but or do we we could if we would write it if we would rewrite this expression in this way i'm going to copy rather than to write 
to insist that this is coming from the previous thing. So I copy this bit here, and then I will subtract. Look, we almost have the difference of two square because here, this is the square of b over two a. Well, you got this bit which is too much. Doesn't matter. Let's put it. Let's chuck it in. I will factorize it. So is it the square this thing? Well, actually, most things are the square of something else. Yeah, you can always say that this is the square of the square root. So instead of putting parentheses, I will put the square root and take the square. So now we've got, look, now we've got the difference of square. So I can write it as x plus b over 2a, that's a then minus b, my square root, b square over 4r square minus c over a, times, so here we wrote a minus b, now I need to write a plus b, so my a is x plus b over 2a, plus, I put the plus, and the b is the square root b square over 4a square minus c over a. And this is supposedly equal to 0. And that's it. Now we solve the problem because now we've got the product is equal to 0. So the product is equal to 0 if 1 or the over is equal to 0. So we broke this equation into uh, two equations, which is, I can write it actually in one equation because they're almost the same. We've got plus or minus. So these two equations I can write as 1 with the provision that I put this plus or minus, which means that I packing it up or bringing together two equations in single form and then we've got the square root of b square minus 4a square c divided by 2a so what I did here is to bring the denominator the same yeah? I multiply by 4a and I made a mistake multiply by 4a For a, like this is the same, you agree that 4ac divided by 4a squared is equal to c over a. Uh, you know, or you can check, I mean, you, if you know that a one half is square root of a, from the rules that we introduced before, you can check that the square root of pq is equal to the square root of p divided by square root of q. Provided we are not uh, doing something nasty with the signs, which is not the case here. So this two way we can uh, actually also factorize in the fractions like this, we can write it in this form. And have only one fraction for everybody, which removes the 2a as a single one. Okay? And this is a very important uh, solution. That's the solution of the quadratic equation. Any equation ax squared plus bx plus c has two solutions, 1 and 2, given by... So uh, this will be 0 when x is equal to the minus of this. So I need to write here x equal minus, because it goes on the other sense. The two solutions are minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac. I don't need to apply this minus there because it's plus or minus anyway. There is no order. Divided by 2a. Yeah, let's get rid of the things that are not necessary. That's the very important result of the quadratic equation, which is also something that you need to know by R. You need to practice, because we are using the quadratic equation, we are solving quadratic equation all the time. So that it works, you will notice that it's important that uh, the square root is well defined. When we say that this quantity that appeared there could be a difference uh, of squares, we made it a square by taking the square of the square root, it requires that we can take the square root, which means that it should be positive. Yeah? If this thing is positive, then we can take the square root. If it's negative, then we would enter into problems. Actually, that would be the topic of coming lectures, that's called the, the fundamental theorem of algebra. We will see that we can always take the square root even of negative numbers. But for that, we'll have to introduce a new class of numbers that's coming for next lecture. For now, we leave it at there with the uh, result of the quadratic equation. We shall read again because it's something that should resonate in your mind like a poem. It's a very beautiful result. Result of the quadratic equation, a squared plus bx plus c equals 0 as two solution x1 and 2 is equal to minus b plus or minus as two solution square root of what is called actually the discriminant of the equation b square minus 4ac everything divided by 2a.